I do these little lectures all over. Uh, this young man right here has been to some of mine, and I, I lecture around the colleges. And, and I last year, I talked about why, uh, why arc strikes are hard, and went through the iron carbon phase diagram and showed uh, I, I had some kind of neat. You might do this. I took apple juice and carrot juice, and I put them in a jar. And when I lecture, I put it right there. And then I talk about the iron carbon phase diagram of uh, the ferrite and the perlite. And I said, well, that's two phases. It's kind of like this uh, jar here. You see the two stratified layers? And then when you heat the weld up, or heat the metal up, it goes into the austenite region. Then I shake it up, and see, that's one phase. And, and I like to do stuff like that students can really understand. And then I take a piece of metal on a magnet, and I heat it up and talk to them, and, and I usually take a piece of 4140 steel, a little tiny piece, and I heat that up and I drop it into a, when it gets up to 1333 degrees, what happens? It what? Yeah, it, it changes, but what else happens? What makes it magnetic, non-magnetic? Well, it <coughs> turns to austenite. And the carbon gets diffused, and then when I drop it in the bucket, it turns real hard. And then you take the center punch and hit uh, a heated piece and an unheated piece, and you can see there's no dent in the one I dropped in the bucket. And then they can start to understand. So today, we're going to go into some practical solutions on solidification. And, and let's see if we can uh, make some sense. And, and this is designed mostly for uh, you guys to use it in class. And I have a website that I have this lecture on, and all you got to do is type into Google Larry Zerker Consulting, and you can find that uh, this on there, and you can download it. I, had my, I outsourced it to India. They, they did it for me. Uh, Anyway, a little safety share. I, I forgot and left my, well, I, I find that as I get older, I'm reaping the, the, the benefits of my bad habits when I used to weld. Grind without earplugs, well, grind without a face mask, weld without a face mask. I, I have done that lately because I got a little bit of a disability, and if I don't take care of my lungs, I really get sick. So I'm finding that you should try to you know, protect yourself a little bit more when you're younger. I still cough from crawling in tanks and welding on it and those bad fumes. And I still have football injuries from playing football. So you got to you protect yourself and, and maybe talk to the students about taking care of them a little self better when they're young. Uh, let's see, I've already talked about that. I taught high school for a few years, taught the welding at Arizona State and Ohio State, welded on aircraft for a couple of years. Oh, I, I love to show these pictures. I, we got a product in when I was working there in, in Idaho Falls the university, I had a little research project at the university, and one of the big fabricators would send these, uh, had built a big glove box. Uh, a glove box is something that you stick your hands inside and, and work on things, and, and the welds were awful. This is beautiful stainless steel. And I, so, and I like to show these, and then I say, if, talk to the students, I says. Well, if you ever did that working for me, you'd probably be fired. And what I'm talking about today is that little hole. <laughs> and then I was out on a, I, I invested into a project up in Montana. And I uh, went up to look at it. And I, that was the high pressure line, 1,500 pounds of pressure they put. And I went ballistic. I said, what are you guys doing here? Who did that work? Oh, he's their favorite plumber. I, <coughs> I thought, no wonder he's not a pipe welder, he's a plumber. And that, uh, I just thought I'd show a, a couple of bad examples. Okay, the goal of this lecture is to provide a little practical approach of why hot cracks happen. 
and uh, maybe you can, it'll get you can get some materials for lesson plans and lectures out of it. Uh, okay, cracks. What's the difference between a hot crack and a cold crack? Anybody quickly rattle off to me what what's a cold crack? It's delayed cracking, usually 24 hours later, hydrogen influenced, uh, even the feed effect is on. These are kind of cold cracks. Uh, all right, uh, hot cracks. There's a whole bunch of them. Caused during solidification, occurs in the weld metal, usually occurs pretty instantly, uh, within a second. Uh, caused by contamination. What's the contamination to a weld? There's two of them, two or three. I can think of three. Maybe you have the wrong gas, but paint, but there's tramp elements. Hydrogen. This, pardon me? Hydrogen inside the metal. Hydrogen? I, I can't, I'm so, I, I usually like to get people to come up, but I can't hear you. Hydrogen metal, trap. Okay. That, I don't know if that causes hot cracks. That's a one cold crack. Right? Yeah, we're, we're uh, but uh, shrinkage stresses, uh, poor joint design. Now, this is what we're going to get into, uh, sometimes welding too fast. I've reviewed the literature a lot for this, and the literature says if you weld too fast, you can get hot cracks. I have never had that happen to me as a welder welding too fast, getting hot cracks, but I've had hot cracks. Uh, I've never had too much voltage, but I've seen a lot of pictures of it. Poor welding techniques, yes, that's an easy one. And it's not caused by service load. It's usually instant. And then there's a few more, and we'll, uh, okay, this is where it gets good. In, in welding on, on steels, you're going to always have stresses with every weld. You're going to always have stresses. Shrinkage stresses, uh, the weld shrinkage, the, the, cooling, the cooling stresses, and a little bit of a phase change. I know I've told this story before, but when I worked in the oil field, they used to mess with me because I was the college boy and we had all these Oklahoma and Arkansas welders and they used to try to mess with my mind and we were welding some pipeline and, and in Wyoming it's always cold or it's going to get cold and we were up at 7,200 feet and we had to weld two miles of four inch pipe and we, after a couple of days we got it down and we run it down to a wellhead and I was going to cut it off, it was four o'clock at night and, and I cut it off and I was going to tack it up and finish it and the guy boss says, no, weld it in the morning. And I had cut it off, it was January or February, and I cut it off right exact to weld. Well, I come back in the morning, what happened? It shrunk 18 inches because it dropped 40 degrees. <laughs> and so, uh, <clears throat> and you can calculate, that's a real easy calculation, you can do it. And, and it was about the size of the fish I normally catch. So, uh, the, and there's always going to be stresses in your weld when you're weld. You cannot, it's like concrete. When you pour concrete, it does two things. It gets hard and, and cracks, okay? You're always going to have the shrinkage stresses and there's always low melting point constituents, contaminants in your weld metal. And what are those two main ones that they usually talk about? If you look real careful on your, uh, your sulfur, somebody said, who said that? Very good. And phosphorus. Uh, those are the two. Now, those you have no control over. But you have control over these. And it's kind of like hydrogen cracking. Stress point, hard microstructure, hydrogen, you get rid of one of those. You don't have hydrogen cracking. So, we don't have problems with hot cracks if you can control these. And I'm going to try to go through some of these right now. And the literature 
uh, has, I've checked, I've got some pictures of these and uh, not enough, but, uh, and it's kind of interesting. So let's, let's go down to, okay, okay. I, I lifted this out of one of the, a welding book. It just shows that what happens to the metal. You start with a piece of metal and it's, and it's perfectly flat when you put weld onto it. Uh, it puts heat into it and it bows it this way. And then after it shrinks, well, it, it, it bows this way because the weld shrinks. And, those are the stresses. Then, here is something that's really kind of neat. This was a little work I did last spring before I retired. And I, that's just a quarter inch spot weld on a piece of stainless steel. We were doing some nuclear fuel element development and, and we wanted to see how much it penetrated. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, isn't that a nice picture? Uh, these, you can see the ripples where it decayed, where we decayed it back down real quick, and you can see how, now you notice that the preferential grain growth is always, always goes to the center, to the heat. It's like a sunflower that follows the sun. And a couple of things to remember, these kind of line up with the columnar grains that you get uh, in the, this is a surface anomaly called a preferential grain growth, but the, the, the actual grains follow the same pattern. And they always grow on a line perpendicular to a tangent. And if so, if you just draw a line, a, a tangent line here, these always grow perpendicular. And it, the, the, they always go to where the heat is last. Heat was the hottest spot. They always grow to the, to the last point of the heat. You know, you, well, that's, that's to be understood. A lake, when it freezes, does it freeze in the middle of the lake? Does it freeze on the bottom first? It freezes on the edges. And then, when it thaws in the springtime, where does it thaw the first? On the edges, because it's warming up. But that's just like on a, on a lake. It always starts to freeze out there and it freezes, goes to the center exactly like a weld. And I got some good other pictures to help this out a little bit. Whew. Let's see. All right. I have seen this happen in some of my earlier welding is where I had the this one here is a picture I took out of, off the internet. I found it. This is the first weld. No, they put this weld in first, and then they put this one on over it because you can see how it goes up. But most likely, when they put this in, it probably came down like this. So the width to the depth ratio was wrong. You, it, you, gotta, you can't be better than one to, if you have one to one, you might have a problem. It's better to be uh, 1.4 wide and one deep so you don't have the crack. Big passes, big single passes that are deep are, will be cause you the, a form of center line cracking. Now, let's look at this here. Now this one over here is a nice big weld but there's multiple layers. See, there's, there's one here, one, two, three, four. Now you can see where the grains, uh, the grains grow this way. And, but here, the, these grains are all growing. You can't see the grains very good, but they're all growing this way to the center. And when those grains meet in the middle like this, that's what causes the crack, and I'll explain that very well in a little bit later. But if, if you have a, a big, deep crack that's real deep in a groove, I've seen those flux core wells open right up on me, and, and I didn't know why. So that's one way to stop a center line cracking or a solidification cracking if you, if you weld too deep. You, you control the bead shape. And there's, that's the bead shape. Keep your ratio. Now, uh, you can make some of these yourself. If you build a, 
I'm sorry for my bad use of terms, but if you will, to put a, 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 a big V on a thick piece, maybe a piece of three quarter inch or one inch, and then put it on a piece of two inch or something as a strong back, and you put one big weld in there, you should be able to get a crack to show your students. Uh, that was something like I was welding years ago and I just got massive cracks right down the middle. Now, surface profile. Surface profile of your is another what way to and, and it works if you get a large gap in a fillet weld and you have a little too much voltage and it puts a real concave weld in there, what happens is is you can see how the grains all grew this or growing this way, kind of, and and because the weld is shrinking, it's stressing. It grows, it grows to the center, and because it's shrinking, it uh, stresses that that part that's really thin. And on a on a fillet weld with a large root gap, that will be much more evident or predominant, and because it'll be. Uh, Maybe I have a little picture here. Yeah, you get it gets so thin, it gets so thin there that the stresses work on that center. I have never had that happen to me. The literature just tells me that that happens, and so I, that's why I put it in. But there's lots of neat pictures out there. All right, here's some workmanship issues on on uh, travel speed. The picture I took out of a magazine or out of a book, they don't finish it. They don't do a, see the, this is, I got the next picture to show it. And you can see that uh, this is very well drawn because this is the base metal here and uh, this is the base metal. And these are the grains. These actually are the great big grains. They get smaller out here and these big, these grains are let me, uh, why are these grains so big right here? And what are those called? Anybody have an idea? Yeah, they, they call those the prior austenite grains. And they got big because if they'd have got any more weld, any hotter from the weld, they'd have melted. But they got right up to melting, right up to about 2,700 degrees, and they didn't freeze, but they were real big, and they were in that austenite region, but they froze, and that's why, that's why the grains are always so big, right next to the fusion, the toe, and obviously that's where it cools fastest, and that's why the heat effect is zone's harder, because it's trapped with carbon. Since this is straight, they all go straight, they all converge here, and these grains, the last grain meets right along here. Now what's happening, it's kind of like, consider you got a sidewalk to clean, and, and, and somebody's at the other side coming this way, and you're going this way, and you're either hosing it down or you're brushing with a broom, cleaning off the sidewalk. And, and the metal's got these tramp elements in it, and they're low melting point constituents, the sulfur and the phosphorus. And, but out here, it's freezing real quick. So that's gotten hard at 2,700 degrees. But that sulfur doesn't melt till it gets, or freeze till it gets two or 300. So it's still, still, still molten. And, when you're sweeping this sidewalk and you're, that guy's coming this way and you're going this way and finally in the middle you meet and you got a whole bunch of dirt and crud. Well, that's exactly what's happened here is this grain is, is def these grains are, are freezing and going to the middle, growing to the middle and it's, and it's rejecting, they call it the solute, the metallurgist, but it's the debris and it's, and it's making a concentration of low melting point constituents there in the middle. And it's like 
having your joint soldered instead of welded and it just pulls apart. That's because I have never had that happen. I've seen pictures of it, but this is the case when you uh, travel speed. All right, let's try another one. I hope this is somewhat interesting. I mean, uh, I find this fascinating myself, but I'm kind of a simple brain guy. All right, which one of these beads profiles lead to crater cracks? Yes. Hey, you go top of the class. Very good. And why did you pick A? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have a an idea why A was? Yes. That's a that's the right that's the right statement. Is that it's uniform. Now, I've done a. I've welded my weight in, in uh, aluminum and, and stainless steel hand, TIG, MIG TIG wire, and, and I've never really had this problem. Now, why do you think I've never really had a crater crack problem? Why do you think I've never had a crater crack problem in my welding? One thing, solving is backing out the heat slowly. Yes. <laughs> I, I was always taught to do that. If you do that slowly, you don't have this problem. I'm saying, but if you pull out real quick, like that guy did on those pictures at the first, uh, and I got some others that are really ugly, you're going to, when you pull out real quick after you gas tungsten arc weld and pull it out quick, well, then you're invoking. The what? Oxygen. I mean, well, gonna... what you're doing is by workmanship screw ups, you are letting those uh, <coughs> low melting point constituents and the stresses, you put three, three things together and that'll cause a hot crack. If you, if you have good workmanship, you won't have a hot crack. But when you have bad workmanship, either root gap or too narrow, you're going to have a hot crack or if you pull your tug torch out too fast, that's bad workmanship and you'll get crater cracks. Okay, let me show you what we, I did it. You, you got it right, you guys. And I just, I just drew little red arrows in here and, and, it, and that's what happens is the converging grains meet in the center and they've pushed all those low melting points constituents in the middle but at the same time, there's some horrendous shrinkage stresses. I don't have it on this slide. There's lots of shrinkage stresses. It's shrinking and it's stressing that center. And uh, there you go. That's, that's that same well that that big fab shop sends us on this. That, that whole love box is full of weld mistakes like this. Boy. How many defects can you see on that? You got what well, kind of arc strike there? You got lack of fill. You got suck backs. Some, some we call those what? Suck backs. That uh, there's another one. That's called a. Well, that's where you pulled out too fast. Now, if we were to grind that down, what do you think might be underneath a little bit? Oh, I don't think so. There's porosity generally isn't formed a nice clean, well, maybe it is on clean stainless steel like this. It's, there's no, uh, there's no, nothing to cause porosity. It, there'll probably be a crack. This is where you get the crater crack or the star crack. Here, there's one that they, uh, oh, I'll show you, I, I'll show you some. But usually it's, uh, See how it sucked back in is because the shrinkage stresses were really working on that hole and it just pulled the metal away and it actually shrunk that much. But you would probably get a little bit of a crack. If you were to grind that down, you'd probably get some crack in the bottom. Star crack, crater crack. This is just not quite as bad yet. All right, let's see. All right, this is where we do something 
kind of fun. Cracks are good sometimes. I can remember I used to do a lot of hard facing on farm implements. And anybody ever hard face on hard farm? And you put real nice, real nice carbide, uh, chromium carbide stuff on there. And then after you step away for a second, what do you hear? Bing, 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 bing. Well, those cracks are good, you know why? Well, they tell you you welded it right because it's the alloy, alloy, alloy is so strong it overcomes the shrinkage stress, overcomes the tensile strength and breaks it. If you don't hear the cracking, you got it too hot. And it kind of self-stress relieves a little bit. Uh, now, this is something that I've done a lot. Uh, David, I've published this two or three times and I was asked to present this at a at a conference a couple of years ago, some workmanship samples. You can build workmanship samples, training aids. Oh, there was an old World War II vet, Iwo Jima Marine veteran that walked on a walker and he came, he was, came over to my, called me and said, Larry, can you come over and help me? I broke off a stud in my Buick, in my engine. And uh, I said, sure, I drove my welding truck over there. I knew what happened, and, and uh, so what did I do? He, he said, I can't get it out, I broke it off. And so I said, no problem, no problem. So I, I heated up the engine block with my rosebud, but then I coated the, the block with soot. Why did I do that? No, it was steel. Yeah, I kind of, because I was going to weld on it in a minute, and I've always found that if I weld on the stud and a little spatter goes out, when it hits that carbon, it doesn't stick to the block. And then also, carbon burns off at 500 degrees. So I kind of get the thing hot. When I get to 500 degrees and the carbon burns off, I know how hot I got it. Uh, just a little, if you anneal, if you're going to bend a piece of copper tubing and you know the feeling. If you bend it one more bit, it's going to break. You just coat it with soot, back your torch off a little bit, burn the soot off. That's the kneeling temperature of copper, and you can bend it three or four times. Aluminum works good too. Uh, this is all about practical little stories. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm an old guy, I forgot so much, but if I can help, help you with your students, because you guys are doing a marvelous job taking young people, giving them skills, getting them jobs. I, I bow to you and respect you for what you're doing. Okay, we had to heat up some molten salt. And I don't know how hot this is, but it's really hot. It's salt that is liquid. And I thought, when I talked to my technician, he said, oh, I got some, I, I talked to him about this. I've been talking about this for eight months to my technicians, and he says, I got something for you. And he went and gave me this, and he says, and they opened the door of the furnace, and you can see, you can see the, the line right there. See that white? That's the salt starting to freeze first. And there's, and, and then he pulled it out so he could see it. Now you can see how the salt is freezing on here. And then it's also on the bottom, you can look and you can see the freezing. And let's just go through this real quick. And now you can start to see the little dendrites form. Look at those. That's just exactly what a well does. I think it probably doesn't do as much in the middle, but I said, I've never looked in the middle, I don't know, but it's freezing really good on the edge and it's starting to freeze. And uh, isn't that neat? Now, that's on my website, and you can drown, download that. Uh, OK. I hope I'm done. I hope this, was this at all interesting to you? It is stuff that I explained to welders. When I get, out, I get out on my hands and knees, I don't do it much anymore because I can't get up. 
I, I, our tables and I get chalk and I draw this out and try to educate them. And, and you can use this. You can call me if you want. Uh, do I have anybody have any questions? I've answered everybody's questions. You're doing a great job out there with the students. You're, you should get stars in heaven for what you're doing. You're taking young kids off the street. You're getting them good jobs, getting them careers. And, and uh, I'd come out and help you and if, uh, if I could. What's the website? Just go to Larry Zerker. It's, if you look at the, in the program, you put Larry Zerker Consulting, and if you look on the website, it'll say a download section. My kids uh, put it on there, and you, I even checked it out that I could download it. So you get in there, and you can download it. And uh, so good luck. See you.